Good evening and welcome to the Dutch Center. We are very excited to host another event for you here live streamed from our venue in the Dutch Church. Tonight is extra special because we have a small audience in the building and you watching from home. To mark Dutch Liberation Day, which was on the 5th of May, we are screening a touching short documentary titled Flying Over Polder Lines. I'm very happy that documentary maker Helene Mindera is with us tonight to introduce the film and to do the Q&A with us after the screening. Also with us, uh, calling in from Almere, is Regional Minister of the Province of Flevoland, Michiel Reisberman, who has been closely involved with this, with this project. Uh, Helene and Michiel, welcome and thank you very much for joining us tonight. Before we start the screening, um, may I ask you to introduce the film in a few words for our audience? Maybe start with Helene. Thank you so much. And thank you, audience and people who are watching this screening. Thank you for attending. Um, you're going to watch the documentary Flying Over Polar Lines. Um, in March 1943, a British bomber, short Sterling bomber, um, flew to Berlin, to Germany, to drop off some bombs on its way back. But very early in the morning, it was shot down by a German plane and it crashed into the Eiselmeer, at Markermeer, for people who know uh, uh, Holland. Um, the plane has been lying there since. Last summer it was salvaged and um, we were able, I with my crew, were, we were able to film this and uh, um, the documentary is, uh, is about the crew, the seven very brave men who, um, who were on, aboard uh, of that uh, uh, plane and um, we give them their face. We know who they, uh, who they are and the, the documentary is about them. Thank you very much, Helene. Michiel, would you like to say a few words before we start? Yes, thank you, Daphne. And, uh, thank you for uh, having us hosting this uh, documentary today. Uh, the Short Sterling documentary is about, is uh, one of many, uh, it's one of uh, hundreds of planes that was shot down uh, over uh, my province during the Second World War. And so it's for us, it's symbolic for all these, uh, the, the people in these planes, the sacrifice they made. And it really gives, in my view, uh, a, a human face to uh, rather anonymous uh, casualties of war that uh, gave their lives for our freedom. So we're very happy to be able to show this in connection to the May 5th celebrations in the Netherlands. Thank you very much, and we'll talk later in our Q&A after the screening. The audience here and you at home can ask both our guests questions. Um, there are two ways of doing that. One is to send a WhatsApp message to the number below on the screen, and the other way is to um, put your question in the chat box of our YouTube channel. For now, enjoy the film. We zijn uitgevaren in 2008 voor een boot in problemen. 
nou, sleepverbindingen dat gemaakt, anker omhoog. En toen bleef er aan het anker een hoop uh, ja, grond, rommel zitten. En dat gebeurt wel vaker hier. En dan is het even schud aan het anker. En dan, uh, dan gaan we weer verder. Maar nu bleef alles zitten. En flink schudden, er gebeurde niks. Tot op een uh, moment dat we wat ijzer eraan zagen zitten. En toen uh, denken we van ja, we, dat hebben we nou weer omhoog getrokken. Vlak voor kerst 2008, toen uh, werd ik gebeld door de KNRM van Marken. Ik ben de volgende dag heen gegaan en ik kwam aan. Ik zeg ook, dat is een uh, aandrijfmotor, uh, elektrische aandrijfmotor van een landingsstel van een Stirlingbomwerper. Dus die jongen zat al zo te kijken van, oké. Okay. Maar uh, ja, nou, dan weet je dat je echt op een crashplaats van een, van een bomwerper zit. En, ja, de Short Stirling is de grootste bomwerper die gebouwd is in de Tweede Wereldoorlog. Wat dacht je? Er is een nieuwe plek gevonden waar een wrak eh, ligt. En eh, een potentieel wrak eh, zijn potentiële vermist. Wij zijn heel blij met het besluit nou, dat er toestel geborgen wordt. Ja, daar ben ik heel blij om. Echt eindelijk na zoveel jaar. Ik ben razend nieuwsgierig wat er boven komt. Sinds de laatste 15 à 20 jaar realiseer je veel meer dat er achter die onderdeel die je boven haalt een, een, eigenlijk een dramatisch verhaal zit. Want het omkomen van een vlieger, dat zet zich door naar de familie. En als je dan die verhalen hoort van de nabestaanden, dat zijn complete drama's. In het voorjaar van 1940 is Hitler in snel tempo bezig met het veroveren van de landen in Oost- en West-Europa. Als ook Frankrijk zich overgeeft, staat Hitler nog één grote uitdaging te wachten. De verovering van Engeland. Tijdens de Battle of Britain probeert Hitler met luchtaanvallen op Londen en andere grote steden ook Engeland op de knieën te krijgen. Maar dat laten de Engelsen niet op zich zitten. De Royal Air Force groeit in razend tempo. Jonge mannen melden zich vrijwillig aan... en worden in hoog tempo opgeleid voor functies binnen de RAF. Ze hadden zich allemaal vrijwillig opgegeven. En dat, dat inspireert mij. Van wat, wat hebben die mannen bezield om, om dit te gaan doen? Duizend flying fortresses sweep out from their bases in England to hammer the German capital. In 45 minutes, 2500 tons of high explosive and incendiaries rain down at the German war office. Het toestel, de BK-716, is van uh, vliegveld Down in Market opgestegen om 21.30 uur. Nou, je ziet het hier al. Nothing was heard from the aircraft after takeoff. Want hij is in het uh, toenmalige IJsselmeer neergestort. De nachtjager heeft hem om even over vier neergeschoten. Dus dat klopt eigenlijk wel precies dat hij al eind op weg was naar, uh, naar Engeland, naar zijn thuisbasis. Alleen die heb hij uh, net niet gehaald.
my darling beloved. Just a short note, hoping it still finds you okay. Another five weeks, and I shall be in your arms again. I'm a bit fed up. The weather has changed, and it's really busy. Remember, I love and adore you and worship the day of days. And I promise you, precious, I shall never let you down. And don't for one instance ever worry about me. I guess I'm the luckiest man in the world. I'm the happiest man. Has a uh, man. Man. In the world. In the world. And, and darling, I pray that you will be safe always and I know that our baby will be a credit to us both. <clears throat> so please, please, dearest, look after yourself. Look after yourself. And remember, and remember we can we still have a and better, we'll have a better, better baby. baby. And that baby? That was you? Yeah. <laughs> I can only go on what they tell me. I know where he lives when he went to the, the Air Force. I know where he works. And um, I knew where they built his plane. Um, you know everything about him? Virtually everything, yeah. But you don't know him? I didn't know him, no. My mother's three months, three months pregnant when he went missing. My father was never mentioned because of my stepfather. We had some letters come from Norfolk about the aircraft, and we ignored it. Did nobody talk about him? No. Nobody in town did? Nobody ever talked. This was in a large frame, and it had, um, like, a paper back, and Richard used to keep his money in the back of the picture. Where was this picture? On his bedroom wall. When he was a little child? Who put it there? Right. Well, his mother, I presume. It was there when I met Richard. And uh, it was there until his parents passed away. When Trevor gave us this tin, which he found in the loft, after his mum passed away. I found that very upsetting. There's just nobody we can ask anything now. You know, we're the oldest ones that are there. And it was just full of all the letters, all the correspondence that she received after. You got this after she was, after she died? Yeah, when she died. We didn't know anything about this before. Well. He was working in the paper mill, just over there, um, which everybody in Sitmore used to do. Do you have any idea why he volunteered? No, the... not at all. Um, if he's anything like me, he'd volunteer because he thought it was his duty, same as I would. Even when his wife was pregnant? Well, it was... He'd volunteered before that. It was life in them days. You had to... The war. Um, without people like that, as I say, we'd be walking as a German. Um, they saved our life. It's as easy as that. And I appreciate very much what they've done. As far as we knew, the plane was shot down over the North Sea. I've always wondered where, thought where his body is.
Let op, Pazel Leo, 47 kan een vliegtuigmotor zijn. Oké. Okay. Er ligt minimaal een meter diep in de slip. Ja. Oké. Okay. Een stukje van de motor, Leo. Slot is ook al gezond. Ja, even aan boord. Goeie conditie nog, hè? Merk ja. staat er nog op. Ja. Red Ferns, made in England. Ja, het, het eerste tastbare spoor naar, uh, naar de crew. Ja. Nou. En uh, hier zie je de tong. Ja. En dan kun je de, eigenlijk de afdruk van de rits nog zien. Zie je dat? Die erop gezeten ja, ja. heeft. Prachtige stille ja. getuigen. Dat is het zeker, ja. Volgens de statistieken kon je, kon je het niet overleven. Eén op de tien vliegtuigen op een vlucht kwam er niet terug. Dus als je tien vluchten had gemaakt, statistisch gezien, dan was het gewoon van... Uh, of je, uh, als je mazzel had, was je met een parachute eruit gesprongen, was je gevangen genomen. Of je was om het leven gekomen. Dus eigenlijk gingen ze het avontuur aan met de wetenschap dat ze het wel eens niet konden uh, overleven. Maar die mannen zaten dus allemaal gewoon in eenzelfde vliegtuig. En ze waren allemaal aangewezen op elkaar, het waren allemaal maatjes. Ik zou er eventjes drie keer over na moeten denken voordat je erin stapt. Maar die mannen deden het gewoon. Heel bizar. I deeply regret to inform you that advice received from the Royal Canadian Air Force Casualties Office overseas states that your son, Flying Officer Harry Gregory Farrington, previously reported missing on active service, is now for official purposes presumed dead. Is what? Presumed dead. They they actually wrote three letters to you and Grandma. The first one sounding optimistic, saying he could just be a prisoner. And then the last one was the grim He'd one. Been dead. Yeah. My father died when I was 11, and my brother, younger brother, had died before my dad. En zo er was Harry en mother en mijzelf left. Ik was probably 16. So Harry was 7 years older than me. He was my oldest brother. After my dad died, he was like my father and my brother, and we were very close. He was wonderful. He was six foot two, probably. <clears throat> he worked in the bank, and the bank manager tried so hard to not get him to join up. He said he is such a clever man. And I, my mother said, it's up to him. And of course, his choice was to join up. All his friends had joined up, and there he was. All the young men that age felt it was their duty 
and they joined up to save our country. The first Royal Canadian Air Force Fighter Squadron to reach Britain is welcomed to the old country by the Canadian High Commissioner, Mr. Vincent Massey, when he inspects men and machines now in England and ready to have a go at the enemy. And now they're fighting fit and ready to take the hit out of Hitler. Dear Edith, well, kid, I've been over Germany quite a few times now and dropped a few bombs for you. Our crew is very pleased because we are getting a new airplane when we come back from leave. A four engines bomber, the biggest of them all. How is school going now? Don't forget to write me again soon. Take care of yourself and mother. Love, Harry. I went up to our main street to get a bottle of ink for school. And they delivered telegrams, a young boy on a bicycle, and he went by and he knew me and he waved, never realizing he was going to my house. And of course, I'd left long enough not to know where he was going. And when I came home, I said, Mother, I'm home. And I got no answer. And I looked around, and I finally went into the bedroom, and there was my mother. And I said, Mother, what's wrong? And she said, I got a telegram just after you left. My brother, when he was in high school, loved cowboy music. And now I sit at the piano and play some of the tunes that he used to love. Well, I do every day, sit there and play with one hand for Harry. I was out in that shed one day, and Janice came out with that le letter. The plane has been found, they're going to lift it. Now I know more what he went through. That's the close I've ever been to him.
Hier heb je die uh, scharniertjes heb je zitten. Hier heb je die nagel waarmee dat leer vast zit. Mm -hmm. En hier inderdaad die beugeltjes voor, uh, voor de hoofdband. We hebben hier menselijke resten uh, aangetroffen. En we kunnen ook zien dat de menselijke resten contemporain zijn. Dus qua leeftijd overeenkomen met de crash. We kunnen dat ook zien aan de fracturen. Hè, dus de, 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 de impact van de crash op die beenderen. Daarvan kunnen we zeggen, ja, inderdaad, deze resten zijn, uh, zijn van de crash. Die jongens hebben samen een, een, een crew gevormd. We hebben samen die operationele vluchten um, gevlogen. We hebben lief en leed samen meegemaakt. Gedeeld uh, zijn samen gecrashed. Um, we gaan ze ook bij elkaar houden. Ze worden straks gezamenlijk, zoals ze gesneuveld zijn, uh, de stoffelijke resten althans in één kist begraven. Uh, en dan zullen de zeven namen uh, vermeld worden op het graf. Oh, it's wonderful to know they found him, all the crew. And And he's not missing. And it's very wonderful that it's Holland. He was coming back. They'd made their target. They were on their way home. If you have something you have to do and you complete it, isn't that wonderful? <sighs> no, it's just put, put me life in order. Since the plane been found, it's a different life. So before, he was a father, flew an aeroplane, and I didn't know him. But now I feel I know him. I don't get very emotional, but I think when we go to Holland, I'm sure I will. In no way would I would not go. I, if I were to walk over there, I'd go. I guess it's almost like a closure. Would you not say? Well, now we know what happened, where he was, and where he will be in a beautiful country full of flowers. Welcome back. Uh, Helene, Michiel, first of all, thank you so much for this beautiful and emotional film. Um, maybe to start off with, how um, did the idea of the project start, Michiel? And Helene, how did you get involved and when? Uh, there is a, a national program for the recovery of, uh, of crashed planes. Uh, it has been running for a few years. Uh, of course, we knew that this wreckage of the remains of the plane were uh, where they were and underneath the water. And uh, in the course of this program, we thought it would be a very good idea, that the, it's a national program, uh, it would be a very good idea to uh, have a special focus on this wreckage because uh, for one, we knew uh, who the, uh, the the family was. Uh, the, of course, uh, having a, a documentary like this, but also uh, all the other things we do is, is a way for us to pay respect to 
to the to the people who perished. And it's also uh, uh, important to realize that the, the, the crash site of the plane uh, is to be treated as a war grave. So uh, we feel it's very important to uh, have all the, the respect you can have to the to the crash site, to the plane, to everything that surrounds it. We felt that it would be a very good way uh, to uh, pay respect to these people, but also to bring back the memory uh, of the, of uh, the people like this uh, who gave their lives. And uh, personally, I saw this uh, when uh, I how this <laughs> things like this work. Uh, when I uh, visited the beaches of Normandy with my kids, I have a daughter who's 20 years old, and she saw the footage of the people storming the beaches. And at that time, she realized that the people who were uh, fighting the war were people like herself, like her friends, who were more or less the same age. And it really brought home the message of the sacrifice, of the pain uh, of, the, of the families and of the people who were involved. And I think it's a very uh, good idea if we can have the same message, as, uh, transmit the same uh, feeling uh, as, as she had at that time by this documentary. Thank you. And Helene, how did you get involved uh, in this project? So the province wanted to um, record this whole thing and um, they asked um, the production company Moondocks in Amsterdam um, if they would think with them how to how to do that and they um, they asked me I'm a freelance documentary maker um, so um, then I was involved in this uh, in this whole program I think it was January or something or February last year uh, and um, I understand that this film was made during sort of the dark days of COVID-19 how did you Very much manage so. How did you manage well, and could you travel? It was quite a challenge. We could not travel for a long period of time. Um, um, we had to wait for months until we were able to go with the Royal, Royal National Sea Rescue Institution, uh, because that, the film is starting with them, uh, the KNRM uh, for the Dutch people among you. Um, they had to wait as well for us to, to take us uh, aboard uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the place where the wreck was found. Um, and I was also not able to fly to Canada or to, to England. Um, I had an interview, yeah, you can tell. There was a, a DOP a cameraman in Toronto. Uh, this woman is uh, the sister of one of the crew members is living in Niagara Falls in Canada. And uh, there was a, a cameraman we knew who, who was living, he was based in Toronto. So he was able to uh, to go and film with her, and he had we had a Zoom um, connection, like an online connection, when I could interview her. Um, and it, it's like a little bit the same like us. We have a three or four seconds relay uh, in this connection, uh, and that was the case with us as well. So then she was answering me, and I had to wait until she was finished, and I could answer or I could ask her some questions. And we did the interview like that. And also all the, um, the sceneries and scenes we were filming, uh, I was directing from my um, living room here, which is the same room as you can see in the picture. Uh, I was directing from here, I'm home-based. Um, it, um, it was, I, I had to work the whole night because uh, Canada is like um, eight hours uh, earlier than we are, so I started yeah. at four in in the afternoon here, and I had to go uh, through the whole night to uh, to wow. record this. And to England, we we went uh, ourselves. There was um, the lockdown was um, was not for I think two or three weeks, and once we heard that um, um, it, England was open and we could go there, we uh, we took a test. The crew and I we took a test, a COVID test, and when we, once we were negative, we jumped in the car and went to Belgium and took the, the, the boat uh, to Dover. Hmm. Yeah, wow, that must, be, must have been a big challenge. Yeah. What I it also was. No yeah, what I also noticed is that sound uh, is, plays an important part in your documentary. It's almost like yeah. a soundscape. Can you tell us a little bit more about your choices and why? 
Um, before I start shooting a documentary, I already have found the music. I'm listening a lot of music. A lot of what you're hearing is are soundtracks from, um, from movies from long ago. Um, I listen so much music. So once I start filming, I first, um, well, I think I'm busy for days or maybe weeks to, to listen to music and to form uh, an image in my head about what what is what the documentary is about and what is the feel I want to give it, and also what is what is suitable because um, music for me is as important as um, as um, uh, built. Well, what's it in what's in English? Well, um, image. Image, yeah, image and 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 sound uh, are equal uh, in my opinion. So, uh, I've been um, listening hours and hours and um, took some parts from everything and uh, and blended it into this documentary. Well, so yeah, it's not it's, written. I mean, it's it's existing music. Yeah, makes it very powerful. Uh, maybe go to Michiel um, for a question. Michiel, why do you and the province of Flevoland think it's important to, to make this film and, and do this project? Because it's not just a film, it's a whole website with interviews and, and all sorts. Yes, the, the website is like a, what we call a digital monument. And uh, about two thirds of my uh, province did not exist yet during the Second World War, about one third uh, was just reclaimed. And, uh, so we, have, uh, we, we don't have a lot of places in our uh, province where we can really show uh, monuments, places where things in, in, in the war happened, uh, except for the places where uh, airplanes like this crashed. So we think it's a very good way to keep the memory uh, of the Second World War and everything that happened alive to make it uh, visible and, and tangible to people. Yeah, these are uh, difficult times to, you know, sh show anything in, in a public place like a cinema. But how is this film being distributed in the province or in the Netherlands? How, how do you go about it? We have a, a, a regional broadcasting station where it has been screened, I think, twice now. So that's, that's one way uh, we distribute it and we're also talking actually to uh, broadcasting stations from the, the southwest of uh, England and Canada uh, to have it shown there, just as we're showing it today. Great, yeah, that'd be fantastic. And have you got any responses? How do people respond to the film? The, I think it's, uh, a lot of people find it much more touching than they uh, expected it to be. Uh, ever since I was uh, in, primary education, I've seen a lot of things uh, on TV and in the cinemas about war movies and in, uh, in history class, you get a lot of uh, information about how battles went, but they're never uh, really focused on the, on the human aspect and especially not on the human aspect of the, the people who were left behind. And I think it's very touching and very real to be able to show that, that through this documentary. Yeah, I, I, I agree, absolutely. Um, maybe a question for Helene. Um, Helene, what was the hardest um, to do in this film to make this documentary? We talked about COVID, but was something else challenging that you can share? We did not this up front, but, but this was, was one of the hardest things uh, to do because um, it felt Helena, really. I think, yeah, I think we just missed your first bit. Can you start over? Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. About my sound uh, equipment, or does it work? Yeah, okay. now it's fine. Um, um, filming aboard of the ship who was uh, salvaging the plane was quite something because the whole crew who was working there were really. Uh, much into, I mean, they really felt what, what they were doing. Um, uh, they really knew that they were salvaging a plane with, with crew members in it or parts of them who are so very, very important for their families to, uh, so they were very focused on, on what they were doing. And it was also, well, it was, my uh, film crew, it was harder than we thought before because then once we were on that ship, we were really standing like 
okay, the, the remains of the plane are underneath us. And let's hope that they will find some, some, some parts that they can identify this crew with because it's so very important. And we didn't know up front if, it, if they would succeed. Um, that was the question. Uh, that was only, I mean, they, they, they salvaged a lot of things also, like what you saw, uh, parts of the engine and all sorts of parts of the, of the plane. But nobody knew whether there were also remain, remains of, of the crew uh, found. And that was, um, that was, well, that was quite something to feel. It was very special. And um, I also felt very sorry for the family members not to be there at that moment because the son and also the sister from Canada, they really, really want to come to Holland. And they have been phoning me for 10, 15 times. What is it like? Can you please show me pictures? Or can you please show me some footage already about the, the, the area uh, where... Um, my, my brother, my father is, uh, probably uh, will be. Uh, and they were very emotional and I really would have wanted them to, to come to Holland and to see it there uh, instead of me because I'm just a filmmaker. Um, so I did it a bit for them. Mm, I felt yeah. for them. Yeah, I can imagine. So we have a few questions coming in from the audience uh, online and in here at our venue. Um, you can answer, you know, it's almost like whoever knows this. Was, the question is, was next of kin tracked down for each member of the crew? Because there were seven men uh, on the plane. Or was it just these two families? The, um, the son uh, and the daughter you just saw were the only ones that were still alive. The other members, they, we knew who they were, but there, was, there is no family left. So there was nobody to um, to ask. Um, well, there is a nephew. That's not completely true. There is a nephew of, of one of them. Um, but we chose to uh, to film these people because they are so directly related to. Uh, this. Yeah, yeah. No, makes the story very strong. Um, another question coming in. What well, people are wondering: um, When will the funeral take place? Maybe Michiel, you can answer that. Is there a ceremony planned to get um, the next of kin to the Netherlands? Yes, there is a ceremony planned. I'm not quite sure if it's uh, it coincides with the the reburial of the remains. Uh, but in uh, October 12th, we have a. Rather large ceremony where we also will uh, uh, have a what do you say when you have a monument that's uh, established? I think the word is uh, for this crew, and we will have a, an, an evening where we uh, will uh, share our uh, pay our respects and share our uh, memories and feelings. And there will also be uh, officials from the national government, officials from I believe the RAF and uh, the Dutch. Uh, Forces. Hmm. Well. Of course. Um, yeah. Well. Yeah. I hope that will be possible soon. Sorry, Helene. Let's hope that the family will be able to fly in then. That 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 that, that, that COVID will allow them to. Yeah. October twelfth. So, uh, uh, well, we hope to do it uh, closer to uh, the, the date. Uh, of, of the crash, which is in March, but mm -hmm. uh, we were not able to due to uh, the COVID uh, measures we have. But we feel that in uh, October it should be able to. We should be able to because, of course, we can see that uh, measures are being relaxed as it is. So probably mm -hmm. after summer we will be able to have this uh, ceremony mm -hmm. as we should have it. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope so. Um, another question. How hard or easy was it to know who was on that plane at the time? As I understand it, it was quite uh, easy because uh, and we are very certain who uh, was on the plane because we found the engine blocks and the engine blocks are numbered and all the, the numbers of the aircraft were uh, very well recorded by the RAF. So we knew uh, which engine was in which plane which took off at some date with uh, what crew aboard, so we know uh, uh, what, what plane it was, who was on board, when it uh, left, and so, so we also know when it was shot down. And uh, from German records, we even know the name of the German pilot who was uh, on, the, I think it was a Messerschmitt that shot down the uh, 
of this, uh, this short study? Um, maybe along these lines, um, a question, how many planes are still not found? They, they must have records of that as well. Do any, both of you know? Are we talking about? Probably, but I think it, it's about hundreds, right? I believe we uh, have a known crash sites of uh, around 150 planes that are still in the water. We also have, uh, I think it's something like 40 planes that are uh, still in the, in the soil, uh, places that were reclaimed. Uh, but the, the, the province of Flevoland was re reclaimed some of these uh, planes and uh, the remains of the planes were actually uh, in the field. So you should imagine there was a, a dike constructed, the water was pumped out and you could actually see the remains of the planes lying in the field uh, uh, together with the remains of boats that sank <laughs> over the centuries too, by the way. But, but, so these planes that were uh, uh, easy to, to salvage were already salvaged. So we have some 40 left that are deeper in the soil and some 150 left that, it's, that are in the water. Wow. Um, uh, I'll just hand it another question. Um, what the long-term long plan is with the remains of the wreck. Is there a, a museum in Flevoland that will take it or, or what's the plan with that? I'm not quite sure, but uh, one of the, the engines, the, the blocks of the engines is part of the monument we will uh, erect this fall. So it will be a tangible part of the monument that you can go and visit. So also in the museum of Johan Gaas, right? The, um, I'm not sure what the name is of the museum, but it's there is a museum in Holland, uh, uh, and it has some parts uh, already. Yeah, some parts because there were some, actually were a, small. a number of containers full of uh, of the parts of the, the plane. Wow! Uh, yeah, as it's you can very see, small, you can see the, like small parts. As you could see in the documentary, they they more or less dredged the the soil of the the out of the water which has the parts of the plane the plane disintegrated disintegrated completely when it crashed in the in the water and uh, what they did is they put the the, the matter they dredged up on a grate and then a, what came out was on a finer grate and a finer grate still until you have i think the particles were down to a few millimeters in size everything was sifted out uh, out of the, the sludge that was dredged so they were really uh, meticulous about uh, finding everything that, that they could dredge up but it is it's really a huge stack of plane parts and they've sifted out what uh, could be uh, all the human remains and they were uh, uh, brought to an institute in Susterberg which is a national institute for the identification of war remains and they're uh, studied there and after identification they will be reburied as we said thank you um, maybe to close, uh, Helene, you made a beautiful film. Are you working on something similar now or what's, what's your next project? I'm working on several projects which are not similar. Um, I'm working on, on um, like four documentaries at this, uh, in this moment. One is about uh, trauma therapy. Um, um, one, is, well, one is about Amsterdam, the city I'm living in. Um, I'm making a series, and um, so there are some uh, some of these. Uh, it's it's not it's not similar um, content, but it's also very interesting. Absolutely, maybe we'll, uh, the Dutch Centre will screen one of those uh, in the future. I would um, love I to. Think, I think that's all we have time for. Um, if you, if the viewer is interested, do go uh, to the website of the Digital Monument. Maybe, Michiel, do you have the website off by heart? Vliegenoverpoldenlijnen.com so Yeah, so it's... It's, it's the Dutch version of the, the, the title, dot com. Yeah, exactly. Vliegenoverpoldenlijnen. Dot com. Um, do have a look. It's really uh, touching the way it's all put together. Thank you, Michiel. Thank you, Helene, um, for your answers and the very beautiful film. Um, and I wish our audience a uh, very good night and hope to see you again soon.